The United Nations says that we have just 11 years left to stop global heating, rising to the point where millions of people will die. And it's millennials and members of Generation Z who are demanding urgent climate action to safeguard their future. On Friday, hundreds of thousands of people in cities across the world started a week-long global climate strike, with young people at the forefront of the demonstrations. In the run-up to today's UN Climate Summit, activists on Saturday expressed their hopes, their concerns, and solutions at the UN headquarters in New York. For so long, young people have been asking for a seat at the decision-making table. Imagine the power of the movement you have created. Today, the leaders are asking for a seat at your table. Our online community has also weighed in on the urgency of the battle against climate change. Have a look. My name is Nakabia Hilda Flavia. I'm a climate activist because our future is at risk and we are running out of time. I choose to stand up and do something, take action to save it. I'm John Paul Jones and I'm a climate activist because our political establishments have been constantly ignoring the scientific and visible reality of the climate crisis we are in. Shie Bastida is a core committee leader at Fridays for Future, an international movement of school students fighting climate change. She is in New York. Aman Sharma is a photographer, conservationist, and climate activist in New Delhi. He is also involved with the Fridays for Future movement. Azra Elham is founder of the Lagman Peace Volunteers, which aims to raise awareness of climate change impacts in Afghanistan. He's currently in Phuket, Thailand, going to school there. Hello, climate warriors. You're welcome to the stream. Mm. Thank you so much. Excited to Thanks. have this conversation with all of you and with our online community. So I want to start online, which is where so much of this organizing has started, with a tweet, Aman, that you sent not too long ago, just a few days. My home, Delhi, you wrote, is set to join Indian cities to have no groundwater by 2020. That means I am going to be stripped of our water resources in 120 days, including a video there. It's a topic that we've covered here on the stream, but for you, this is personal, Aman. When was it that you knew that you were a climate activist? When did that hit home for you? Um, I think India is this diverse land that has such an amazing green cover and biodiversity and even the people here. But just looking at the fact of how my own city, New Delhi, is the most polluted city in the world and how our groundwater was running short and heat waves were striking our city, and the way I, from my own eyes, could see the wildlife in my city dwindling and vanishing rapidly. That's when it really struck me that if I don't take action right now, and if I don't say that this is enough, and children need a stake in the decisions that directly impact and affect their future, I realized that there's no point of me sitting at home and not doing anything about this, because this is a matter of our survival. And really, you know, for a lot of people, Climate change might be a hypothetical situation that is taking place in some far off hot place. But for me, as you said, it hit home and it's a reality for a lot of people living over here. Gia, it was a reality for you. You are literally a climate change migrant. Can you tell our audience the story that meant that you had to leave Mexico and you now live in the United States? So I was born and raised in Mexico. I lived there till I was 13 years old. And in 2015, my town suffered from heavy rainfall that resulted in flooding from uh, the majority of my town. And that was the first time in which I encountered the climate crisis. When I moved to New York City, I saw the effects that Hurricane Sandy had had on the community. And that's when I realized that the climate crisis follows you. It's something that is affecting everyone everywhere, but it's, it is affecting marginalized communities and communities of color the most. And so I couldn't also just sit down and not do anything. I thought, I'm going to strike for justice. I'm going to strike because uh -huh. there is no other thing to do. Gia, yeah. when climate activists, youth climate activists get together, what do you talk about? Um, we talk about when our next strike is going to be, mm -hmm. we talk mm -hmm. about... <laughs> <laughs> Planning, strategy, okay. <laughs> All right, Gia, yeah, ask Ellen a question. Go ahead. Um, I want to ask you, what inspired you to be a climate activist? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? 
Yes, what was the thing that led you to be a climate activist? Oh, the climate activism started uh, back in 2019 when the floods, like the very heavy floods, hit the western parts of Afghanistan and hundreds of families were evacuated and affected and 35 lives were lost. Also, when I went to back home this summer and I really felt uh, that uh, scientifically there, uh, they were saying that 0.6 percent the uh, degree of temperature was rising, but traditionally I could feel much more than that. And that was the, the time that I really wanted to to stand and and to do something. So I hear uh, the, the urgency of why you decided to get involved in your voice. I want to share uh, the perspective of someone else. Very similarly, Hanifa says, I went on climate strike because, as it is, the climate change issue is a very serious predicament. And it feels like it is being taken lightly, while in reality, our future is at stake. And then, like you, talking about those high temperatures, Hanifa says, climate change has impacted our communities through the variable temperatures, unpredictable rainfall patterns, making it hard for agricultural productivity, drying water sources, and increased vulnerability. Alham, I want to stay with you with this tweet because you were invited to come to the U.S. for this first ever uh, global youth climate summit, but you weren't allowed. What happened? Uh, so basically, uh, the unfortunately, uh, uh, on 9 September, the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok, they uh, rejected my uh, non-immigrant visa applica application uh, to join the summit. So unfortunately, I couldn't uh, benefit from the opportunity of team working with other uh, climate activists and participating in the UN Youth Climate Summit. Mm -hmm. So you're watching the Climate Summit, the Climate Action Summit from a distance. Let me show you something here on my laptop. Earlier on this morning, the Swedish youth activist Greta Thunberg, um, she, she tweeted as she was heading to the United Nations says, oh, I'm, I'm on my way to the UN. Today I'm speaking in the General Assembly at the Climate Action Summit. This is such a crucial day. World leaders are gathering at the UN in New York to decide on our future. The eyes of the world will be upon them. This is Greta. I'm wondering if she's already thinking about what she's about to say, because what she said made the news. Here's a recap. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? Shia, unlike many of us, you actually know Greta. Let me show you something. Let me show our audience something here. This is from your Twitter feed. And I think you, I love the way that you're very down to earth here. You've got an OMG on your head and an OMG on Greta's head. I think that's what most people would do. You received her as she came to New York. You were there at the media conference. You've been there with her in the last couple of weeks. So when she said that at the UN earlier on today, your thoughts were what? Um, I was actually in the room as well, and when she said that, I saw that for her, it's not about us being activists and us being out there and us making our voices heard. For her, this is about our futures and our life and us not being heard at the level that we should be. It is about the science not being acted upon. It is about our leaders not doing enough, but doing too much talking and not enough action. So... My favorite part of what she said was, we are watching you. Mm. And, and you know, because we are. And I was there for most of the day in the General Assembly. And I was listening to every single leader who went up there. And I know that all of them call this crisis an emergency. But I don't know what they're going to do to take action. Mm. And so we are going to be here. And we're not going to stop striking. And we're not going to stop our voices heard. Because our work right now is to raise awareness, not to provide you with solutions. Mm. 
I, I, I want to share a video comment from someone who thinks very similarly and has that same passion in their voice. This is Petros. He's a climate activist in Athens, Greece, and here's what he told the stream. I got involved with Fridays for Future because I believe that climate change threatens us all. We may need to change a lot of things. Our way of living, the way we think or work or even how education works. But this is all for the sake of preserving our home, the earth. Because the earth is not something that we get from the elders, it is something that we borrow from the, from the younger generations. And it is in our hands to protect them, to preserve the earth, to act and to bring change. So you could hear there, he says, this is something that we've gotten from our elders. I want to dip into a little bit of a debate that's happening online um, between people who say, this is the older generations who have left us with this mess, and others saying, that's not quite fair. So have a listen to this or look at this tweet. This is youth climate activist who says, I'm calling on the older generation to step up their game towards saving humanity and the planet. In times of flooding, more bridges and draining systems should be built, more tree planting. This sh should be encouraged now is the time. On the other hand, though, we got this tweet from Matthew who says, this very conversation is creating an us versus them topic. This is part of the problem, and it's a major factor in this mess. So, Aman, I'll give that to you, an us versus them, the older generation versus the younger generation. Where do you fall in that debate? You see, I think the citizens that we have now, especially the young people, are to us, great extent and degree environmentally conscious and politically aware of what needs to be done to curb the biodiversity crisis and climate crisis that we're facing right now. I do not think that the us versus them um, debate is so big or crucial that it can undermine the entire topic, which is climate change, which will impact all of us equally probably impact the marginalized and disadvantaged communities first, but in the long run, it's going to impact all of us. But definitely, you see, just the fact that you have three kids on the panel here asking their leaders for a livable planet and calling themselves youth activists, that shouldn't be a term. And this shouldn't be a point that we have to reach and that we have to come to. Because, I mean, you have children out on the streets asking for their right to a safe future. And it is not our responsibility to right the wrongs of a generation which was sowed so long before, probably before I was even born. So I think that is my stance and my view on this. There's a sense of leadership that is coming from the youth climate movement where adults are feeling like they need to now act or at least say they are acting. Alham, is that your power? Because you don't necessarily have a power to vote, you don't have political power, but is that your power to actually maybe guilt an older generation? Uh, well, uh, uh, that's one of the things I wanted to mention about the elder generation. Uh, whether they were involved uh, in making this mass or problem or catastrophe for us or not, well, but they are now exactly the ones that are in power because we are most of uh, the high school uh, students or not in a position, uh, as, as early mentioned, to vote or, or something like that. Uh, but the problem that uh, we are facing is that they, the older generation also uh, experienced the problem with us because uh, uh, now uh, if we look at the, 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 the problems that, that are caused by the, the climate change at the moment, uh, uh, not to just consider the future, that the older generation, younger generation, female generation, uh, we are all uh, equally affected. And uh, I think uh, we, we, not just to blame them, but we, we, we do require their assistance. We do require uh, ask them to, to stand with us and to listen to us. We, we don't want them to, to be in front line, with, uh, to, to be against in the line with us uh, for, for just blaming them. But, it's, but they, we, we want their assistance and help. Mm, right. I, I think uh, Liz here on YouTube would agree with you. So Liz just writes in uh, live saying, I found Greta's speech extremely powerful. It brought me to tears as I know she is right. We want the conveniences of life at the expense of our climate. Uh, someone right under her comment there uh, says, this is Zinc Inc. production, who says, honestly, I believe it's time for young people to take action. Most of us young people don't pay attention to what's going on around us, even within. Young people, it's time to take 
action. So Shige, you see these comments that people are writing here as they're watching you all speak and, 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 and this conversation that we're having. Talk to us about the challenge in bringing other people to this fight, whether they're young or in older generations. Um, I think that a big part of why a lot of people are not taking action is because they are desensitized from information. And so I think that one of the most important things to address this is to bring personal storytelling into the mix. When you bring personal storytelling with data, people are 22 times more likely to remember something. Mm. And once you bring <laughs> storytelling, once you bring storytelling, uh -huh. you change the narrative. And when you change the narrative, you change the culture. And we need, what we need is a culture in which we take care of the earth because that is our lifestyle. Yeah. The fact that the environment, sorry. Yeah. No, the fact that the environmental movement is a movement should be a reason of urgency. It should be part of who we are. I love that you use data to tell us about storytelling and data. So if our audience, if, that, if we're going to use that for our audience, what story would you tell our audience that would make them 22% more likely to pay attention to this conversation? Shia, go ahead. I would tell them, you know, my town was affected by the climate crisis and it did not have the infrastructure to drain water or the infrastructure to, serve, to come out of it um, better than when it was before. And so they, re, that really shows you how low-income communities and communities of color are most affected. In the Bronx, 17% of adults have asthma. And in lower Manhattan, that is not the case. And so the fact that we have environmental racism and environmental structural racism mixed into the climate crisis is uh, one of the reasons why we have to take action. Because this is about uh, the injustices of the climate crisis and what the climate movement has been until we young people are bringing those voices to light and we are saying enough is enough of lack of representation. Uh, Malika, I, I, I wanted to add a point with the personal storytelling is that uh, last summer, uh, 40 nights, uh, I, I didn't have a relaxing sleep because of the 45 degrees of temperature, which is, which not, which is not the way it used to be. Or currently right now in the Phuket, uh, which used to be known for the, having a very uh, fresh air quality, now I can't breathe because of the Indonesian fires at the moment. Um, I would like to pitch in here. I would want to say that I think one thing that we really, really need to do is go to these villages and places where communities that are disadvantaged or less represented are really being affected by climate change and bring their stories to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, I mean, we can imagine and think about what is happening to them. But again, the fact is that for us, it's a situation for some of us. And for people, it's a reality on a daily basis and how they're suffering and how their voices are being ignored by an inefficient policy structure that, in my view, even our conservation policies are supporting industrial objectives rather than environmental standards. Um, so I think bringing these stories is really important. Um, Aman, I'm so glad you said that because we have a video comment of someone saying something very similar. Her name is Faith Ward. She's an organi organizer with a group called Zero Hour, and she's here in the U.S., in Ohio, and she talks about the most marginalized communities. So have a listen. I work with an organization called Zero Hour. And I think for myself and a lot of the people on our team, we understand that the environmental movement has to move beyond simple calls for conservation. We're in a climate crisis, and as we try to fix it, we also have the chance to try to uplift historically marginalized communities, black and brown communities, indigenous communities, those that have always been left behind as society tries to move forward. With this crisis, we have the opportunity to bring justice to them and try to fix things and fix the system that has always left people behind. That's why we act. So our, our audience couldn't see, but all throughout that comment as it was playing, Aman was vigorously nodding his head in agreement, I'm assuming. Aman, what were you thinking? Um, I completely agree. I think this is a chance to get those communities that haven't had a say in policymaking or may not form the major vote banks, a chance at getting an equitable choice and chance at the future. Because you see, I think at least in my country, the climate crisis has resident notions of racism, colonialism, slavery, and discrimination showing up. As you know, Shia said, that you have these people who are living in such places 
And just because they are a disadvantaged community, they are being given less preference, even though they are facing the brunt of our mistakes. So I think it's really important. If you look at my country, India, once colonialism came here, um, things like hunting was made legal and large patches of forests were opened up to things like poaching or deforestation. And slavery ensued where native plants were replaced by invasive species. So it's really important to give these people a voice because it's going to affect everyone equally. Mm. And you need climate justice. It's not only about climate action, it's about climate justice at the same time. Mm. Making connections with so many issues that all connect up to how the climate is changing. I want to show you something, um, and our guests have already seen this, uh, in terms of the, the attention that young climate activists are getting around the world. We're going to go to Brussels and Rio and Bangkok. Just a little sliver of what it was like on September the 20th. Have a look. I'm here today because I feel like I am betrayed or abandoned by my governments. I am disappointed that they won't accept the scientific truth behind all of this. I am here to so my, my voice can be heard by them. We're protesting to have a habitable future and a habitable planet, air to breathe, food, water. We need to dissolve this problem now. What scientists have been saying has been happening for a long time and we haven't done anything. We're skipping school because the teachers teach us how to work in the future, but if we don't do this, there'll be no future for us to work in. So what's the point of studying in school if um, the world's gonna be gone? Shia, you've been organizing local climate strikes in New York. You mm. take that on regularly. Other than that, as a tactic, what else are you doing? What else are you able to do? Um, aside from organizing the climate strike in New York, which had 315,000 people, uh, I've also been involved in policy advocacy. So I've testified in the city council so that New York City would declare a climate emergency. I went last week to D.C. to talk to different senators on how they are tackling the climate crisis. And I'm seeing a lot of thank yous. Like, I'm sure you've heard Greta say, we don't want your praise, we want your action. And so to see all these senators saying, you are the leaders, we're going to follow you, is a very, very counterintuitive when they are supposed to be the leaders. Uh, but I am doing a lot of this work of, getting involved in the political sector because we do need political action and I am also training new activists in my activism training program. Mm. And that's because of course the work continues. So I am bringing this up. This is from Greenpeace Canada. We just lived through the largest climate protests in world history, spanning all seven continents with global estimates at four million people. Who wants to break that record next Friday, September 27th? see you in the streets, meaning that there is still more to come. Elham, in just about a sentence, what's your message for world leaders? Well, uh, for the world leaders, uh, I really want them, uh, it's not just about uh, scientific uh, evidences, because they were uh, uh, proposed uh, the scientific evidence quite, quite a bit of most, uh, most often, but just to look at the the, the current the problems that are caused by the climate change, like right now, as an example of my country, where uh, unfortunately the war has been going on for the 40 years, and then for the last five years, the narrative of war has been changing from a war on terror to a war on drought and uh, water uh, accessibility. And the every day, the, uh, in, in the past 12 months, around uh, three th more than 3,000 civilians lost their life between the uh, um, cut and the Alan, we could do a whole new show on this topic alone. Thank you so much for bringing it up and, and bringing our idea and our understanding of the climate youth activists around the world. You bring a perspective from Afghanistan. Arman, thank you for bringing your perspective from Delhi. And uh, Shia, you, you cover the US and Mexico as well. Thank you so much for being on our show. We're talking about youth climate activists around the world and the impact that they're having. And this concludes our Covering Climate Now initiative, but we will still continue, Malika. Mm -hmm do environment stories. Yeah, looking forward to it. See you next time.